I'm going to jump straight into the word because I'm so excited to preach. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. If it's your first time here or if you have been here for months, welcome home. You are my favorite person in the room. This is a place where you can encounter the love of God with people that love God and love each other. And we get together every Wednesday night with the goal of encountering God, experiencing him, being transformed by him, and leaving with a couple extra friends in the process because you were just not meant to do life alone. Amen? Amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to give you the title. And uh, we're going to jump into the sermon for tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 19, we're going to read verses 9 and 10. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The title for tonight's message for my note takers in the room is God Knows. Everybody say, God Knows. knows. Turn to your neighbor and say, God Knows. knows. Turn to the neighbor that you didn't like as much and tell them, God Knows. Oh, oh, God knows. God knows. I don't know about you, but I have all these favorite memories from growing up. Family vacations were always the bomb. And we went through um, a bankruptcy when I was kind of stepping into teenage years. So when we got to go on vacation, it was like blowout party, can't get enough of it kind of vacation. When we finished bankruptcy, my parents took the whole family to Disney. And it was the first time I had ever been to Disney. And if you've never been to Disney, let me tell you, it is, in fact, the happiest place on earth. The first time walking through Magic Kingdom and I'm looking around and everything's just so happy and just so free. (laughs) And maybe it's because I'm just a child, but it was an absolutely incredible experience. Well, over the summer, Livy and I got married, one of the most incredible memories that I have. We got to go to Tybee Island in Georgia, just outside Savannah, and we have incredible memories there. We bought these long boards and we rode them absolutely everywhere. We were those goofy people that like, we tried to pretend that we were the cool surfer people at the beach when we go once a year if we're lucky. (laughs) Neither of us can surf, but you should see me boogie board. So we take these memories in, we enjoy it, we love it. Maybe it wasn't like a family vacation. One of my my favorite memories growing up from a church standpoint were high school fall retreats. The middle school ones were incredible, but middle school is just awkward as it is. So I preferred the high school fall retreats. Yes, summer camp was incredible, but there was something special about these fall retreats. When we disappear in the middle of nowhere in these cabins and Holy Spirit showed up every day time. I always went home a better person. It was like I experienced God in a whole new level every time we went. And in the midst of this moment, while I'm there on the mountain, while I'm there at the beach, or while we're getting married in this beautiful moment, we were looking at pictures this week and Livy and I both were like, oh, well, we want to go back and experience that day again. There's just these moments in life where everything feels perfect. And you want to take a like screenshot and go back to it at any moment that you can. You know what I'm saying? These happy moments. Maybe it's not even a big blowout kind of thing like a wedding or a family vacation. There are few things better than playing volleyball at the Cove in the fall when the weather's just right. And it just, it's not hot, but it's not cold. And you've got all the friends around and you just ate way too much pizza (laughs) and your team is winning. That's also a key part of this, this enjoyment. And everything just feels right for a minute. Now, if I can be kind of doom and gloom for a minute, one of the things that makes these moments so difficult is it's like they never last. You can be right in the middle of this incredible family vacation, this awesome volleyball game, this awesome coffee moment with a friend or a church service where God is moving so powerfully and it just feels perfect. It feels like for just a moment, everything settles into this life that maybe you were supposed to live in. It's just so happy you love the people. It's the most alive that you feel is in these happy moments. But why does it feel like these moments never last? One of my favorite authors, his name is John Eldridge. He's written a ton of books that were all incredible. 
But this week I was going back and reading through one that's called Journey of Desire. And I want to read a quote from the book. He says, something awful has happened, something terrible, something worse even than the fall of man. For in that greatest of all tragedies, we merely lost paradise and with it, everything that made life worth living. This isn't the way that things were supposed to be. If you go back and you read Genesis, what you'll see is God created everything and everything was good. And you've got Adam and Eve in this wonderful garden of Eden with Jesus. And everything is good. And everything is happy. And everything is fulfilling. And these moments that we cling to for dear life of just happiness and excitement and ah, oh, greatness was every moment of every day, constantly. And that's the kind of life we were created for. That was what was intended. But we can so quickly get stuck in a tricky situation now because we don't live in Eden. And we desire desperately to be back there. And there's this thing inside us that longs for those happy moments and desperately longs for them to last longer than they do and to find them again in every moment. But here's the situation. Because we have this reality that we don't currently live in Eden and those happy moments never last long enough, life is also filled with struggle and hangups and addictions and brokenness and hard situations. And aren't you glad your pastor's preaching such an uplifting message right now? <laughs> Life is full of these struggle moments and that breeds complacency where it is so hard sometimes just to believe that tomorrow is gonna have one of those happy moments that we all long for. And if I'm being honest, it's a whole lot easier to just assume that it won't. It's a lot easier to do this whole safety mechanism mess where you just believe tomorrow just is what it is. This is as good as it's going to get. And we start saying those things like, well, God's in control and everything happens for a reason and it'll be okay and everything will settle. But then you found yourself in a space of complacency. And I genuinely believe that when you stop dreaming, you start dying. There's something inside you that needs that joy of the Garden of Eden. There's something inside you that needs more. John Eldridge continues to say that we abandon the most important journey of our lives when we abandon desire. We leave our hearts by the side of the road and head off in the direction of fitting in, getting by, or being productive. But you were created for more than this. Our main passage is in Luke chapter 19. I promise to be brief tonight. I want to get back to, um, so, to some worship. I believe God is doing something powerful. So I'm going to be brief and, uh, and we'll give Holy Spirit an opportunity to do something on a, on a personal, intimate level. Luke chapter 19, where we're at tonight, we see this guy named Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus was three things. He was rich, he was powerful, and he was rude. <laughs> Nobody really liked this guy. He was a chief tax collector, which tax collectors at the time were not great people. <laughs> Their job was literally to go from house to house, from town to town, and to take taxes on behalf of whoever was in governmental leadership at that time. But these guys had all this power to take money from people, so what they started doing was upping the tax rate and putting it in their pocket, whatever they could get out of these people. So they were known for lying and cheating and stealing. And not only that, this dude isn't just a tax collector. He is the boss of the tax collector. So we really don't like this guy. But he's powerful and he's rich because of it. So he has the things that a lot of us would say are the most important. He's well known, even if not for great reasons. He has all the money to buy whatever he could want to buy. And he got to the top of the line of work that he was working in. But he finds himself in a situation where he's really not all that fulfilled. And he hears that this guy named Jesus is coming to town. Now, Jesus 
is this crazy guy that shows up that declares that he is the son of God and he is miracle after miracle and he's loving everybody and he's, he's doing things that don't make sense to the religious people and there's this mess of confusion surrounding this Jesus guy. And Zacchaeus hears that he's coming to town and his interest spikes. Gets all intrigued. So Zacchaeus shows up to hear Jesus speak to the group of people. And there's a ton of people around him. The fourth thing that Zacchaeus is known for being, it was powerful. He was rich. He was rude. And homeboy was short. So he gets to this crowd and he can't see anything. So the Bible says that this dude climbs up in this tree so he can get up high enough to see Jesus, to hear what he's teaching and to figure out what in the world is going on with this Jesus character. And then something incredible happens. Jesus, who is surrounded by all of these random people, he calls that guy out that's in the tree. And he says, hey, I'm coming to your house for dinner. Come down out of the tree. I'm coming to your house for dinner. Now, there's a whole other sermon for what we would do if Jesus told us to cancel our plans because he's coming to the house for dinner. But in this moment, Zacchaeus is like, oh, shoot. Oh, OK, we're going to do this. We're going to happen. We're going home. It's going to be fine. They go home and they're spending time together. And all of a sudden, this stuff starts just changing in his heart. And the more conversations he and Jesus have and the more things go on, he eventually just on his own starts saying, you know what? I'm going to give this stuff back that I've stolen. Anybody that I've cheated, I'm going to give back every cent to those people that I've cheated money from. And it's like just by being around Jesus, he changes his whole world around. And then Jesus says this statement. Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. You have a massive group of people around Jesus that day as it was everywhere he went. And he calls Zacchaeus out. This guy stuck in sin that nobody really likes. And what stood out to me this week is that Zacchaeus knows there has to be more. Even if he hasn't like legitimately in his head gone, oh, I'm just depressed with life, I need more. He's so intrigued by the news of this Jesus guy that he has to get around him to see what's up with that. And then Jesus looks at him in the tree and says, hey, what's for dinner? (laughs) And there's this beautiful moment that takes place where this guy dedicates his life to Jesus out of a realization that there has to be more for him than where he currently is. See, Jesus saw from him sticking in the tree and coming to show up in the first place that Zacchaeus wasn't satisfied where he was. Jesus saw that he realized there was more to this life thing than where he was. Jesus saw his desire for something more. But Jesus also saw his pain. He also saw his loneliness. And he also saw his need for Jesus. There's this, again, kind of doom and gloom (laughs) realizations tonight. If you've ever gone through something hard, there's this crazy feeling of isolation. Nobody understands. Nobody understands. Nobody really gets what it's like to feel what I'm feeling right now. And what the people that love you will tell you is, you're not alone. Other people get it. Other people know you're not the only one that's gone through a heartbreak. You're not the only one that's lost a loved one. You're not the only one that you're not alone. And in this room, I promise you, there are people that have been through similar situations to what you have gone through. And therefore, they can relate with the pain that you currently are feeling. But you are the only person with your chemical makeup in your brain. And you are the only person that is going to go through whatever you're going through the way that you're going through it. So if I can just offer a little bit of bad news before we get to the good news in a minute, there isn't a single person that really processes it the way you do. 
except Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is baptized. The heavens open and God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then he's led into the wilderness for a couple weeks where he fasts and gets tempted like crazy. Jesus knows what it feels like to deal with temptation. In Matthew chapter 14, John the Baptist is beheaded. John is Jesus' older cousin. It was prophesied that a man would go before the coming Messiah to declare to make way for Jesus was going to show up. So then Jesus does show up. Jesus knows what it feels like to lose a loved one. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus has been arrested and he's about to be crucified because one of his disciples betrayed him. And then on top of that, one of his closest disciples, Peter, denies even knowing him three times to keep from getting in trouble. Jesus knows what it feels like to be tempted. He knows what it feels like to have a family member die, and he knows what it feels like to be abandoned. But Jesus doesn't just know your pain because he experienced his own issues. He knows your pain because he took it on himself. And there is so much theology in here that I'm not going to try to unpack tonight. I'm just going to read this scripture and we're going to, we're going to move in. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus didn't just fight sin or experience sin. He literally became the full weight of sin. On that cross, the agony wasn't just the nails in his hand. It wasn't just his shoulders coming out of place because of how bruised and beaten and hanging on that cross. It wasn't just the, the, nors, the, the thorns on his head. It wasn't just the physical pain that he's in. It was the weight of the sin of all of humanity was placed on Jesus. So there may not be a single person on the planet that can literally process exactly what you're going through the way you're going through it. But Jesus literally took the full capacity of the shame, the regret, the depression, the loss, the hate, the whatever you're feeling. He literally took the full weight of it on that cross. And that is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the craziest trade in the history of the world that he is going to take all of my mess, every tear that I cried, every sin that I committed and will commit a couple thousand years before I was ever born. He's going to be willing to take on the full weight of all of my filth so that I can have abundance, so that I can have his righteousness. It is the most radical trade of all time. There's an old gospel tune. <laughs> it's called, When He Was on the Cross, I Was on His Mind. If you'll indulge me for a minute, I'm not a, a Gaither vocal singer by any means, but I want to sing this to you. It says, I'm not on an ego trip. I'm nothing on my own. I've made mistakes and I've often slipped. I'm just common flesh and bone. But I'll prove someday just why I say that I'm of a special kind. For while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. The look of love was on his face and thorns were on his head. Blood was on that scarlet robe and it was stained in crimson red. And though his eyes were on the crowd that day, he looked ahead in time. For while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. 
for he knew me. And yet he loved me. He whose glory makes the heaven shine. And I'm so unworthy of such mercy. For while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I was never going to be able to deserve it. And I was never going to be able to earn it. But the beauty of the gospel is that he took my pain and my suffering on that cross so that those happy moments that I so desperately cling to could be my eternity hand in hand with him. Will you stand with me tonight as the band comes back up? This is literally <laughs> the greatest trade in history. So don't miss it. My entire message tonight, the entire reason that we gather tonight is so that we can focus back in on the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the most incredible thing that has ever happened to humanity. And sometimes we get so used to Sunday church, so used to normal everyday life that we miss that he traded your shame and your guilt and your heartache and your depression and your illness for abundance. And it doesn't always make sense in the moment and not every day is great, but you were created for more than just clinging to the next happy moment because he paid such a high price so that you could have more than that. So eyes closed across the room. To the, the child of God in the room, wake up. From your slumber, from the depression, from the pessimism, from the negativity, wake up. It may not be fair, it may not feel right. The illness is real, the anxiety is real. Losing a loved one hurts. I don't wanna diminish the struggle of the things that happen in life, but he took it on himself. So don't get so stuck staring at those things and fix your eyes on the cross of Jesus Christ. For the lost child in the room, this entire service is for you. So if you are here tonight, or if you're watching the video afterwards, and you would say, I have not made this trade, tonight is the night. As Jesus said about Zacchaeus, Today, salvation has come to this house. So everybody in the room, whether this is your first time praying it or you've prayed it before, I want to give us all an opportunity to recenter on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you'll all repeat after me, Jesus, I need you. I really need you. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for me. Come on like you mean it. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose for me. So be Lord of my life. In Jesus name. 
God, we thank you for who you are, and we say yes and amen to your plan and your purpose for our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness that pursues, that sees the brokenness and has personally experienced the weight of my junk, of my shame, of the things that I'm currently battling with, the things that I have battled with, and the things that I will battle with. Thank you that there is forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation and life because of this trade. So, Lord God, let in me a new joy rise up. Let in this room a new joy rise up. As we come alive out of that grave of complacency to dream again. Because you died for abundance. In Jesus' name, amen.